Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Treffer, founder of Melprep. I invented vacuum compression molding to simplify hot melt extrusion development work. Thank you, Katrin Reusch and Mr. Huber, for your invitation to speak at your summer lecture series. Let's jump into my presentation. And I would like to open with a question. Why are we doing hot melt extrusion? Well, there are basically two main applications. Let's start with the solubility enhancement. To illustrate what can be achieved with hot melt extrusion, marble is often used as a reference material. Marble has a solubility of 10 microgram per milliliter and is classified as practically insoluble in water. This is a good thing as it allows us to marble at marble sculptures like the Venus de Milo. Let's do a quick thought experiment though. Imagine we would need to administer a dose of 100 milligram marble to our body. How much water would be required to dissolve it? If you do the math, you will come to 10 liters. This would be an impractical amount of water to drink. However, when we look at poorly soluble APIs, they are even more difficult to dissolve. Microconazole has a solubility of one nanogram per milliliter. This requires 100 cubic meter of water to dissolve. Even with beer, the second number seems out of reach for a single human. So what's the trick here? How can we dissolve them and make them accessible to the human body? The trick is solubility enhancement by using a soluble carrier. The crystalline state is very hard to dissolve because typically you have lattice energy holding the single molecules together and you need to overcome the lattice energy. When processed in a molten state, uh, in a hot melt extruder together with a carrier material, you can form a solid dispersion. In the best case, a solid solution in which single molecules of the API are embedded inside the carrier. When the carrier is dissolved in the body, the single molecules are released and are available for the body. The second application is the manufacturing of implants. To make an API dissolve at a defined rate is not an easy task. To increase the administration from days to weeks or from weeks to months or even years. Prominent examples are birth control products like intervaginal rings or long acting floating devices, which are currently under development. But let's look at my story. When I started my PhD, I was challenged to develop a new formulation. And I quickly learned that making a good representative sample with defined geometry is not an easy task. In particular, when material costs are high and losses are not allowed, I had a lot of question marks popping up and a lot of failures. At one point, my advisor asked me, Daniel, how are you spending your day? Luckily, after years of failure, I had a light bulb moment that changed my life. I came up with the VCM idea. What you can see here is the first sketch that I made. I refer to it as the birth of melt prep. This here is my invention in all its beauty, the VCM tool. The vacuum compression molding process transforms any thermoplastic powder into a solid specimen with defined dimensions, parallel surfaces, and no air or moisture inclusions. And the best of it, it works lossless. Put one gram of material in, and after typically less than 10 minutes of processing, you get a perfect one gram sample out. This is the heart of the VCM technology. A PTFE foil is rolled up to cover the lateral surfaces of the VCM chamber. A disc-shaped foil covers the bottom of the VCM chamber. It is lightweight and can be filled on an analytical scale directly. After filling, the opening is covered with another disc-shaped foil on top. The foil's arrangements allow the distance to go up and down. The volume of the chamber is adaptable and allows the piston to follow the material behavior during processing. After the VCM tool is connected to the vacuum unit, the air is drawn out and the powder is compacted. Subsequently, the VCM tool is placed on the hot plate to initiate the melting. The powdery material forms a homogeneous melt. As a rule of thumb, this takes about five minutes. Once completed, the VCM tool is transferred to the cooling unit to cool it down to ambient conditions. After cooling, it is taken apart and the sample can be released with ease. The PTFE foil can be built off like stickers. The platform I have designed to make the VCM tools easy to use is called the VCM Essentials. On the left-hand side is the heating unit. The temperatures go up to 300 degrees C 
and the vacuum unit is in the back and the cooling unit is in the front on the right hand side. The VCM tools are manually placed first on the heating unit and then swapped over to the cooling unit as they go through the processing steps. A typical VCM sample preparation takes less than 10 minutes. One thing that I'm very proud of is the small scale development that we did. I kicked the VCM tool off with a 25 millimeter disc dimension in 2014. Colleagues at the RCPE and customers of our first installations were requesting smaller dimensions for their investigations. We decreased the size down to five millimeter for DSC applications, then we reduced it even further to two millimeter to enable subcutaneous implants. And now our smallest dimension is 0 0.3 millimeter in diameter. With such small dimensions, you can use milligram or sub milligram material amounts to enable screening. We have also figured out ways to make complex structures so that our clients can screen for core sheath implants or co-extruded formulations with our technology. On this slide, you see the entire portfolio of geometry that we offer off the shelf. We can also provide custom geometries if this is desired. To understand the benefits of VCM, I think it's essential to talk about how we mix an API into the carrier material. Unlike an extruder, VCM does not mix mechanically. With vacuum compression molding, you only compress and melt the material. To illustrate the mixing mechanism, we prepared the following examples. If one puts multicolor pellets into the sample chamber and runs the VCM process, one will obtain a disc without any air inclusions. But you can see the phase boundaries between the individual pellets. There are no shear forces, no macroscopic mixing. How can we obtain a homogeneous result then? Let's recall the mass transfer basics that we have learned in school. There are two mechanisms. First, convection, also known as shear or mechanical mixing, and there is diffusion. We don't have mechanical mixing, so we need to empower diffusion. How can we do that? Using small particles instead of pellets enables perfect mixing via diffusion. We used an orange color dye on an HBMCAS powder on a powder blend to illustrate that. To improve the homogeneity, we have to fully empower diffusion by reducing the length scale even further. The way how we usually recommend doing this is by cryogenic milling. Reducing the particle size before processing via VCM will allow you to obtain extrusion-like results and a more first transparent disk in the best case. Another option is also solvent casting. We dissolve the mixture in suitable common solvent and let the solution evaporate. Take off the remaining film from the battery dish and put it into the VCM tool. It will also shape into a completely homogeneous disc that is extrusion-like and suitable for further investigations. With that in mind, one can benefit from the VCM advantages and accelerate the early steps of a hot melt extrusion project. And obtain beautiful amorphous disks or implant losslessly produced via VCM. I have one key message before we move on to a few case studies. VCM allows formulation development without extruder process development. Why is this important? Let me illustrate. When we perform a conventional HME-based formulation approach, we have to cope with a complex problem. In math, this could be expressed by an exponential expression. Since the pandemic, we are all a bit tired of looking at the exponential growth of a curve. So I decided to express process with boxes instead. Each box represents its own design space for its parameters. And in this combined approach for development of a formulation with an HME, we end up with a lot of boxes. In short, we have a very complex problem. If we, however, develop the formulation first on VCM and then scale it up to hot melt extrusion, we reduce complexity and come to simplicity. We solve step after step. A mathematical model to describe this is a simple addition. So if we do that, it results in less work and then a higher success rate. So, it is key to develop the formulation via VCM first without starting the extruder and then 
once you have the formulation, you do the process development. So you scale it from an VCM to an hot melt extruder. How does this die into the truck development process? VCM is a clear game changer in the early stages with material requirements of a few grams or less. So this is good before you move into the clinical phases. Lystrates can support your early activities as they have VCM melt prep available in the technical center in Germany. Once you're ready to move on, the results can be taken from VCM, translated to a hot melt extruder, and then you can supply the demand for a clinical batch. It usually starts with a 12 millimeter twin screw extruder and then moves up to 18, 27, 40, or maybe even 50 as the demand grows. Let's move on to some case studies. I would like to start with a case study that has been developed by Epi in Germany. They developed a method called microscopic erosion time testing. This is a technique uh, to determine the maximum drug load in an ASD that shows erosion during the solution behavior. They used 10 millimeter diameter samples, 50 milligram each with different drug loads. The samples were embedded between two uh, microscopic cover slips and the gap was filled with uh, water as the solution media. Then it was put on a microscope and observed for one hour. The example shows the microscopic images here from above. One can clearly see a different dissolution behavior between the left and the right images. Samples up to 32.5% dissolved freely, whereas concentrations higher than that showed recrystallization and were not able to dissolve. This study demonstrates how the max drug load in a carrier can be determined. The next study that I would like to show was performed by a PhD student of Professor Rapka at the Mississippi University. She was tasked to check if VCM gave comparable results to hot melt extrusion. For that purpose, indomethacin with 30% drug load and different carriers were chosen and processed and afterwards compared. What you can see here are clear transparent disks obtained by vacuum compression molding for all four chosen carriers. But down the road, it's always the question, do the dissolution profiles compare? This is the data that she obtained. The dissolution shows a very good agreement between the preparation methods. I would like to point out a Bartek MXB at this point. It has a very good parachute and was able to maintain the highest supersaturations amongst all the carriers. If you haven't used it so far, this is definitely something worth checking out as it may solve some of your development challenges. The VCM samples can be dissolved also directly in a dissolution tester. This gives intrinsic dissolution behavior and provides a deep understanding of what is going on. I have a time-lapse video to show an example. Both were phenofabrate loaded samples with 10% on the left side with Soloplast, on the right side with Colid. The dissolution behavior was completely different between both cases. Left, the Soloplast samples showed swelling and the dissolution was diffusion controlled. Whereas the right sample eroded quickly, also releasing the drug quickly. Let's move on to the next example. Are you interested in working on multi-layer systems? VCM allows you to fuse multiple layers to one specimen. So you can prepare various layers in advance one by one and load them into the VCM chamber. Subsequently, you process them during one final VCM cycle into a single specimen. You obtain a multi-layer sample with distinct layers, sharp interfaces. One well-known application for a multi-layer system is the Nuva ring. It is a contraceptive administered as an intravaginal ring, as an IVR. A group in Graz wanted to mimic the complex structure of the Nuva ring several years ago. The Nuva ring uses a drug loaded core with a surrounded a diffusion barrier to limit the drug release. So the prototype that they developed was a VCM sample that was a sandwich of two 100 micrometer thin diffusion barriers and in the middle was a drug loaded core. Then they covered the lateral surface with a barrier glue 
used optical coherence tomography to check for the interfaces and see if the diffusion barriers are uniform in thickness. Afterwards, they checked that the sample and the co-extruded version to dissolution. In the dissolution curves, you can see a good match of VCM and the co-extruded sample. What does that mean? It is empowering the single researcher. One single scientist can perform the VCM process, making the samples the first half of the day and still has the afternoon to focus on research. Whereas with co-extrusion, one has to conduct quite some process development. We are talking about weeks and kilograms of material before a good prototype of a new formulation can be obtained. This is a huge advantage when you use VCM. VCM can also help you with product development tasks. Rheology on VCM samples can help to find the processing window for your extruder. During my PhD, I realized I can only help if reproducible data is available. During viscosity measurement, shear is applied to a molten sample and the required shear force is recorded. A rheometer assumes a homogeneous sample. Inhomogeneities like bubbles lead to falsified data. Compare these two images taken just before the measurement. The perfect VCM sample on the left and many bubbles in the powder sample on the right side without proper sample preparation. How can it be applied for hot melt extrusion developments? In general, the viscosity of the same carrier containing different API is decreasing immensely with increasing API content. This is also known as the plasticizing effect. Adding 30% of API reduces the viscosity of 3000 Pascal seconds at 170 degrees C down to only five Pascal seconds. The time temperature superposition allows you to shift those curves to different temperature levels. You can predict operating temperatures before starting the extruder. In this case, it predicted a temperature decrease from 170 degrees C to 100 degrees C. And the best of it, it just perfectly worked when we turned on the extruder. This is very powerful. Less material is wasted during process development and you gain valuable know-how to reduce the operating temperatures to avoid API degradation. People usually ask me how much material is required. Will it save us material? We have depicted the requirements here. Standard rheology tests are done three times for each API concentration. 12 samples, weigh around 12 grams with 1.8 grams of API. To reduce the amount, you can do also microreology. 12 grams with 8 millimeter diameter require only 300 milligram of material with 45 milligram of API. Imagine operating an extruder at the lowest throughput that you can imagine, uh, let's say 20 gram per hour. You have less than a minute to find your operating parameters before you wasted the amount of material you would need for rheology. If this is still too much for you, even smaller sample sizes are available, but they also require experienced rheologists to perform those measurements. 10 milligram of total material requirements equals to an extrusion time of a few seconds. Is it worth spending a bit effort in rheology? I think the savings are enormous. Even with standard rheology, you only need a few grams to perform this measurement. Rheology is certainly something that I can recommend for process development. Because this information is very helpful for the Lystrates team to provide you with a well-designed extruder in the end. But rheology can also address an important formulation topic, stability. There is a research group of Professor Sadowski in Germany she and her team have developed an approach to determine phase diagrams via DSC and use rheology data to predict the stability of an ASD at a given concentration. Their method is published and freely available, but requires some background knowledge in the field. If you are new to this topic and need quick help, I can recommend reaching out to their university spin-off called Amofor. They provide this as a service. 
With that, I think I was able to give you a glimpse of our VCM technology. There is more information on our webpage, including a page that lists all publications in the literature that use VCM. We have a second product line that I would like to mention here. It is called Extrovis, and it's an instrument to measure residence time distribution. Extrovis is very helpful for scale up and troubleshooting. It uses a camera to record the outlet of a continuous process like an extruder and evaluates the color information after a tracer was added to the inlet. This here shows a couple of snapshots from one experiment. The color travels through the machine and allows us to derive the residence time distribution. The evaluation is fully automatic and gives you easy to read parameters for the residence time distribution. Extravis was developed by Andreas Krutzke and became part of MeltProp a couple of years ago. This technology is also available by the Leistritz Technical Center in Germany. With that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Please feel free to contact me via LinkedIn and also follow our company page on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions.